Welcome to the second episode in a Legendarium series about the Carthaginians. In part two, The Tyrant of Sicily, we will talk about how Carthage's multinational army helped to secure growing wealth for the ruling class of Carthage. However, that military would face its greatest test yet in a battle for Sicily against the Tyrant of Syracuse, Agathocles. Traditionally, scholars portrayed the Carthaginian military as being a mercenary force recruited from around the Mediterranean. However, since the Carthaginians ruled these far-flung colonies for generations, the subject nations gradually became client states, obliged to provide military service to their overlords. Indeed, the treaties which bound these nations to Carthage, either in alliance or subjugation, included quotas for soldiers. While this created a hodgepodge army, it also made a much more versatile military, offering many different means of hitting the enemy. Even better, these foreign professionals tended to be better at their jobs than citizen soldiers. The Balearic Islands off the coast of Spain provide a good example of the benefits of flexibility. To eat, young boys in the Balearics had to kill small animals with slings. This created a vast pool of slingers who readily found work in Greek, Persian, and then Carthaginian armies. These slingers could hit human targets from 600 feet away, twice as far as an archer. Rather than picking up rocks as they did at home, Balearic slingers made acorn and almond-shaped ammunition from clay, iron, and lead with two-part molts. Some of these ammunition pieces could weigh up to a pound. The slingers even added personal touches, carving lightning bolts and scorpions into their tiny missiles. Others even had messages, like take this or ouch written on them. The Whittier Slingers wrote for Rome's backside and catch. Carthage's importance rose dramatically after the fall of the Phoenician city of Tyre to Alexander the Great in 332 BC. Wealthy Tyrians who bought their freedom and lives from the Greeks with heavy ransoms fled to Carthage with their remaining wealth. These rich refugees streamed into Carthage and established the African outpost as the world's newest and richest trade center. The newly wealthy Carthaginians drove the native Africans from the area. They took many to the slave markets in Carthage while the survivors paid them tribute. Soon enough, Carthage allied itself with Numidia, which agreed to provide horsemen to the Carthaginian war machine. With Phoenicia now under the rule of the Alexandrians, Carthage took over the remnants of the far-flung Phoenician colonies. Along with their homeland of North Africa, they took over Sicily and Iberia. Sicily, with its strategic location in the middle of the Mediterranean, became a particular flashpoint in the ancient world. There, the Carthaginians deployed their elite corps of citizen soldiers, the Sacred Band. Members of the band were picked from among aristocrats who showed off their magnificent armor and equipment in battle. They wore lion skin cloaks, armor and spearheads with elaborate engravings and gold brooches. They further set themselves apart with their gleaming white shields which shone in the sun. Within a generation, Carthage became the premier maritime power in the Mediterranean. As Carthage grew, their trading ships traveled as far north as Britain and as far east as Egypt. The descendants of Tyrian refugees built vast estates that covered many acres. Carthage's harbor grew to immense size, shaped like a half circle filled with slots in which ships could dock. Gleaming marble columns rose around the harbor decorated with Greek sculptures. Massive walls encircled the harbor with an entrance 70 feet wide. To prevent enemy vessels from entering, the Carthaginians strung a massive chain from one side of the harbor entrance to the other. In military affairs, Carthage made a clear distinction between those of Phoenician descent and the native Africans, with the former being free citizens and the latter subjects. Those of African descent had an obligation to serve in the army, while Phoenicians did not. Because of the ruling class exempting itself from wartime service, the Carthaginian military took on a much more diverse character. 
Many Carthaginian soldiers came from the western Mediterranean, including Greece. As Carthage expanded into Iberia, they recruited Spanish and southern Italian soldiers as well. In stark contrast, the Carthaginian navy employed only free citizens, which provided better trained marines and officers, most of whom had vested interests in preserving overseas colonies and trading posts. The Carthaginian military faced its greatest test in the crown jewel of the Mediterranean, Sicily. Not only did the island provide rich olive groves, but it held a strategic position in the middle of the Mediterranean. Any trade between Asia, Europe, and Africa likely passed through the vital island. This land would be plunged into war by one self-made tyrant, Agathocles of Syracuse, who was born in 361 BC. He was the son of a potter who owned a small workshop and had become a citizen of the Greek colony of Syracuse. At first, Agathocles trained in his father's craft. In peaceful times, he would have simply taken over his father's shop. However, when war erupted between Syracuse and its rivals in Sicily, among them the Carthaginians, Agathocles joined the army. Indeed, Carthage's famed sacred band would be destroyed at the Battle of the Cremissus in 339 BC by a Syracusan army led by Timoloan the Greek. Agathocles served in the army with his younger brother Antander. He proved so adept at killing people that he was able to marry the widow of his wealthy commander named Damas. Not surprisingly, Agathocles began to show political ambition. The oligarchs of Syracuse grew fearful that he might overthrow them, so they exiled Agathocles to southern Italy. There he found work as a mercenary. After many wars, feuds, and adventures, Agathocles returned to Sicily around the year 317 BC, 44 years old and a grizzled veteran of many wars. With an army of fellow mercenaries, he joined the city of Regium in a war against his hometown of Syracuse. Agathocles crushed the army of Syracuse, and then he celebrated his victory by executing 600 members of the city's ruling elite. The survivors fled the city, leaving Agathocles to declare himself Strategos Autocrator, or sole ruler. There he settled in with his wife Domus and his two children, having been separated from them for many years. Having had a taste of power, Agathocles now wanted more. So he invaded the cities which had backed the oligarchs of Syracuse, Messana, Akragas, and Gela. In time, Agathocles' warmongering attracted the attention of Carthage, which hoped to expand into eastern Sicily, now being conquered by Agathocles. In 311 BC, Agathocles led the Syracusans against the Carthaginians, who were led by Bomilcar, at the Battle of the Himera River. Because Bomilcar outnumbered Agathocles and held the strategic hilltop of Echnamus, Bomilcar crushed Agathocles, losing only 500 Carthaginians to 7,000 Syracusans. This defeat should have marked the end of Agathocles, but in a bold move, Agathocles left his brother Antander in charge of Syracuse while he prepared an invasion of Carthage. By then, the Carthaginian fleet had blockaded Syracuse. Somehow, Agathocles broke out of the blockade with 60 ships and landed in Africa with 14,000 men. Around 307 BC, Agathocles won the support of Aphelus, the ruler of Cyrenia, modern-day Libya, by offering him any land that they conquered in Africa together. Agathocles' wife's hometown of Athens sent a steady stream of mercenaries to bolster his ranks. For a time, Aphelus and Agathocles campaigned side by side. Soon enough, they reached the outskirts of Carthage itself. Bamulcar failed to return to Africa in part because he wished to conquer Sicily and make himself king of the island, much to the ire of the Carthaginian ruling elite. Yet just as a conquest of Carthage appeared possible, Agathocles and his men attacked the Cyrenian camp. Agathocles' men took Aphelus prisoner, and Agathocles had him executed. With their leader dead and far from home, the remaining Cyrenian troops swore loyalty to Agathocles. With his army almost doubled in size, Agathocles plundered the countryside around Carthage while he planned a siege of the mighty Carthaginian walls. 
According to the historian Diodorus, the combined army so frightened the Carthaginians that they sacrificed 500 children to the gods to ask them to protect their city. More practically, the Carthaginians also raised an army and eventually confronted Agathocles in battle. They fought him to a stalemate, but as part of the peace agreement, they allowed Agathocles to remain the master of Sicily in exchange for leaving Africa. Agathocles went home to Sicily, and the rulers of Carthage were so disgusted by Bamilcar's disloyalty that they ordered him crucified. However, when Agathocles went home, he learned that his two sons by Damas had been murdered. Hoping to have more children, he married two more women, including a daughter of the Greek king Pyrrhus and then a princess of the Ptolemaic dynasty of Egypt. However, he still had a grandson named Archagathus who grew hungry for power and feared that any more heirs would replace him. So Archagathus poisoned him in the hopes of taking his place. Instead, the city fathers of Syracuse ordered the city to hold elections to choose new leaders. Unfortunately, these leaders did not prove to be the capable war captains that Agathocles had been. Soon enough, the Carthaginians swept back into western Sicily and retook control of much of the island. However, it would not be long before Rome challenged Carthage for the right to rule not only Sicily, but the Mediterranean. And that wraps things up for this episode of The Legendarium. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, press like. If you want to see more, press subscribe. And if you've got anything to say, let me know in the comments section. Thanks again for joining me, and I hope that you have a great rest of the day.